Thank you for joining our New Life Bible study entitled, The Good News Doctor, taught by Pastor Alan Brooks. The New Testament book of Luke examines in detail the life and ministry of Jesus and is written with the warmth and compassion of a good old-fashioned family doctor. Prepare your hearts and minds for what God has for you personally as Pastor Alan leads us in our study. So, Tom Brady is apparently holding out, you know, in terms of committing to this next season. Any of y'all heard that that are more sport fans than, say, I am? Well, I was really struck by it because I decided to do a little bit of research on it, and, it, and apparently the $21.5 million that he was paid last year made it a little bit difficult to make ends meet. And so, um, now, you know, when I, when I look at a guy like this, I mean, the, guy, the guy's good looking, okay, at least the girls told me that he is, right? Um, he's married to a supermodel, if you guys don't know that. But so here's a guy that on the surface at least has it made in the shade, right? I mean, he's, he's one of those successful quarterbacks in all of NFL history, makes tons of money in my mind. In fact, I looked it up. He's actually worth, his net worth is nearly $200 million, but he's still holding out a little bit for this season. I secretly suspicion it has something to do with his wife because she's actually worth $400 million. And so he's just trying to catch up maybe to, you know, where she's at. But I mean, if you think about that collectively, they collectively have just under a billion dollars at their disposal. Now, let's be honest with each other just for a moment. Most of us in one form or the other have sought after some fame or fortune, have we not? Maybe not necessarily in football or maybe not necessarily at that level was our hope, but I think all of us have sought and, sh and strived even at some point for that. I can tell you that in my corporate days, I was very much on that, you know, that treadmill or that uh, hamster wheel, whatever you want to call it, of going and trying to have more and more. But there's a great story in this, and I'll come back to it in a minute, but I think it ties in a lot with where we're going in our passage this morning. This morning, we're going to continue through the book of Luke. We've been in this study for quite some time. We're actually going to finish it, believe it or not, next week. But as we're looking at the study today, we're going to see some of these elements and how they tie together, these issues of fame and fortune. If you're not already there, I would direct you to verse 41 and chapter 20. And we're going to start there. Jesus is speaking and he said to them, we'll talk about them in a second, but how can they say that Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he his son, Jesus asks. Now, there's a couple of terms that I think are helpful for our study today that I just want to touch on real briefly. When we hear the word Christ, we need to recognize that that's not Jesus' last name. Okay, hopefully you didn't think that was the case. Christ, our English word, comes from a Greek word, Christos, which is actually comes to us actually from the Hebrew, but both of them refer to the Messiah the Hebrew mashak, mashik. The, this promised Messiah is what's in view here, who this Messiah actually is. That's a very critical piece because the Messiah is the idea of a deliverer, someone who would in fact be a savior. And that's what Jesus is asking this question about. It's not clear who them is in the passage, who he's speaking to, but a pretty good study would tell us that it's probably the scribes and probably the Pharisees as well, and along with some others that are there with it. But they're talking about the Psalms. For those of you that might not know this, the Psalms are a book of our Old Testament. That book has 150 of these different Hebrew worship songs, in some cases poetry. 73 of them are related to this guy, David. Now, who's David? Well, here we're talking about King David, who ruled Israel in about 1,000 B.C. So it kind of gives you a sense that Jesus in the first century B.C., excuse me, first century A.D., is actually talking about somebody over 1,000 years old and asking a question relevant to that. They're looking at a particular psalm, and it's our Psalm 110. By the way, it's the most quoted in all of the New Testament of Psalms. 
Here it is in Psalm 110. It's verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. But what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to what I have on the screen here. Those two words, the Lord, you'll notice Lord is in what kind of a type? It's all caps. Whenever you see those two words like that, it's actually the Hebrew word Yahweh, the personal name of God. Now, if we look at the other English word spelled L-O-R-D that's not in all caps, that's actually the word Adon. can also refer to something else you're familiar with. Adonai. But both of those reference someone who's a ruler or a master. Now, what's interesting about Adon is that ruler or a master could either be a human being or it could be God itself, himself, because it's used in both ways in the scriptures. That's going to become very important to you in a moment, and you'll see why. But here we see as well this statement that the Lord is saying to the Lord that he's going to make his enemies a footstool. What do you think that means? They're going to be entirely defeated. They're going to be destroyed. And he says as well of that other Lord that he would sit at his right hand. That's the position of prominence or power in that culture. And that should reference for some of you even some thoughts out of the New Testament. But Jesus is asking a question now. In our study for the last few weeks, we've been seeing the religious leaders asking Jesus questions to try to trip him up. I would tell you that I believe it's now Jesus' turn to ask a question, not to trip them up, but to wake them up. And I've got to tell you, even as a teacher, pastor myself, I get that. Because what we want to do is we want to cause people to think and to reflect on what the scriptures are saying and going, wow, what does that mean to me? And that's exactly what Jesus is doing with the people in his audience. He starts with this softball. And basically in Luke, it's just a rhetorical statement that he makes that everyone knows the answer to. The answer is the son of David. The reason everyone knows that's the answer is because that's what's in the Old Testament. That was prophesied about the Messiah, that he would be from the lineage of David. Here's one of the passages that speak to us out of 2 Samuel 7. This is God himself speaking to David the king. And he says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up for your offspring after you who shall come from your body. In other words, he's talking about what kind of a descendant? A physical descendant. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Who did that? Solomon. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now let me ask you a question. Did Solomon live forever? So obviously there's something else in view here, is there not? And, and here God is saying, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Who does that make you think of? See, certainly we with New Testament eyes see that, of course, as being Jesus. But this is where Jesus throws his hardball. Because he asks this question that's really perplexing, maybe even for some of you as we read it this morning. How is it then that David refers to the Messiah as my Lord? How can the Messiah still be his son? You'll notice the scribes and the Pharisees that are there, they have no answer to that question. Whether they're clueless or they just don't want to say, we're not told. But they have no answer. The answer is quite frankly, in my opinion, a mind bender. Because the answer is the Messiah is both God and man. See, men don't live forever. So we know that this has to be a supernatural being that would reign forever, right? Yet this person's also a physical descendant of the line of David. There's only one person that we're aware of that meets those two criterias. And that, of course, is Jesus. Jesus is both fully God and fully man. Now, whether you know this or not, this was a big controversy in the early church. See, some believed that he just simply appeared to be a man, that he was really God. And so they emphasized his deity. 
But then there were others that said, no, no, he was just supernaturally enabled by God. So he wasn't a deity. He was just a man who was especially empowered by God. This was this big controversy in the early church. It wasn't actually settled officially until about 451 A.D. It was settled at a church council. Here's what was determined. Listen to this. Following the Holy Fathers, we all with one accord teach men to acknowledge one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at once complete in Godhead and complete in manhood, truly God and truly man, consisting also of a reasonable soul and body, of one substance with the Father as regards his Godhead, and at the same time of one substance with us as regards his manhood. Don't miss that Jesus, as he's throwing these questions out, he is covertly saying to them, I'm the guy. I'm the one. I'm the one who is both God and man at the same time. Now, honestly, everybody's mind somewhat blown by that in the first century is it at some level probably should blow your mind here today. How is that even possible? Well, with man, it wouldn't be. But with God, all things are possible, right? Go on to verse 45. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Josephus, the historian, tells us that we're really three primary groups of religious leaders in the first century. One of the groups we don't really see in our New Testament, and that's the Essenes. But they were kind of like this monastic community that lived out on their own. They're the ones that, if you know your history a little bit, are primarily responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's that group. But the two groups that we do see in the New Testament, one we've already talked about, the Sadducees. They were because they didn't believe in life after death. They were the liberals of that first century. In contrast to them, those who did believe in resurrection were the Pharisees. And there's a group that's closely associated with them. Sometimes those groups are together, sometimes they're seen separately. But that group are the scribes. Interestingly, in the first century, not a lot of people knew how to read and write. I mean, in our culture, it's pretty common that people know how to read and write. But because it was so rare, the people who could were in high demand. The scribes primarily were responsible for copying as well as teaching and interpreting the scriptures. In fact, uh, I watched this movie recently, probably some of you have seen, called Fiddle on the Roof. There's a refrain that uh, Tevi, I think is his name in the movie, says over and over. What is it? Tradition! Right? He's really referring to the oral law that was brought into play all the way back with these scribes and Pharisees. Ironically, that's what it ties back to. See, the scribes felt like what they had to do is they had to help the people understand what God meant. When God said, honor or observe the Sabbath, they said, oh, well, here's what God means by that. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. See, they felt like people didn't, couldn't understand it unless they kind of explained what God meant. And so from the hundreds of laws that God gave us, they added thousands on top of it that the people had to try to keep which was, as you might imagine, impossible. And even if you know your script, scriptures pretty well, the reality is the law, the rules, the procedures, they don't cause us to walk in love with God. They help us understand what God's ways are, but it isn't about the law ultimately. It's about our relationship and our love for God that causes us to live them or not. And that's part of their problem here. Some of the scribes were also lawyers. We see that also in the book of Luke. As lawyers, what would they have done in the first century? Help me. What? Litigated. They would have litigated, but in addition to that, think about it from a reading and writing standpoint. They would have wrote out legal contracts, right? So when people are making arrangements with one another to buy something, they would write out those contracts, but they would also write out people's wills. And that's an important little piece for this as we get closer into it. 
Notice that Jesus says to beware of them. One of the reasons he gives is they dress differently. Now, even in our world today, when somebody dresses a lot different than the way everyone else seems to dress, what does that usually mean they're trying to do? They're trying to draw attention. That's exactly what the scribes were doing. They, they wore these long, flowing robes so everyone knew, oh, wow, that's one of the scribes right there. They wanted people to see them. They wanted to be well-known. Jesus says, in fact, they wanted to be greeted differently. So when you saw a scribe in the marketplace, you would have to say, Master or Rabbi. They wanted to be greeted in a way that showed the special place that they had in their culture. You know, even in the church today, every once in a while, people will come up to me and refer to me as Pastor Allen. And, and I get for some people that's cultural, but i got to tell you, it's kind of weird for me. Because for me, I'm not really looking for that extra layer of information. Just call me Alan is what I usually tell most people, right? Because it seems a little bit different. As a quick aside, I was, I was looking at some mail that came in from my uh, past employer who I worked at Calvary Chapel, and he had got a letter that said to the most holy high reverend Skip Heitzig. And I'm like, wow, there's so many <laughs> things in that, right? You know, it's just... But can you imagine somebody who would want that to be a part of their distinction? That's these guys. That's what they wanted. As well, they wanted the box seats. If they were going to be at the feasts, if they were going to be there at the, the local synagogues, that's what synagogues were, they were the local houses of worship. If they were going to be at that place, then they wanted the best seat in the house. In fact, I was at, in Israel a couple of years ago, and I took a picture of one of those synagogues and what it looked like in that first century. And you kind of get a sense of how it was. Everybody typically sat or stood around the outside, and the place of prominence was right where? Right in the center. And that's where these guys were looking. But the big rebuke I would suggest of Jesus is that they devoured the widow's houses. Now, recognize this. A widow in the first century had it a lot harder than a widow in our world today. And I don't want to minimize people that lose their spouse in our world today, but I want to show you a stark difference. There was no life insurance in the first century. And so if the primary breadwinner died, that was a problem, especially if there wasn't an older adult son to kind of carry on the family. And so the widows were very often left with not even a way to earn money for themselves, totally dependent upon receiving charity from other people or from the temple and the uh, group of religious leaders themselves. That was a first century widow. So they had it tough. But they had it a little bit tougher because of something these scribes were doing. See, the scribes, when they would write out these wills, they would encourage the man that what he ought to do when he dies is to give all of his land and holdings over to the temple. Because what that would do would earn him favor in the next life with God. And some of them did. Which left their widows and families with virtually nothing. And then it would seem that what they would do at these ceremonies is they offer these big pretentious prayers. It seemed like the more the person had paid, the longer they would pray. Just to kind of cover up all that they had done. And that's what Jesus re is rebuking in this situation right here. To me, as I look at this, I see that the scribes in particular sought fame. They sought after fortune. Because at some level, you know, some of that money probably came back through their hands you know, after these estates were settled. But Jesus is pointing out to them something that's very important. Their devotion to God was a pretense. It was pretentious. It was pretend. It was for show. Their heart really wasn't in the devotion. They were just going through all the motions, checking all the boxes. Hey, we're good with God. And then going on and living their lives. And these are the ones, the scribes and the Pharisees, who believed in the life beyond this life. They weren't like the Sadducees and just living for this life. But they got caught in this trap as well. What does Jesus say that their future involves? Greater condemnation. Because they should have been, as we, I would suggest, should be examples. And they weren't. Jump with me into verse 1 of chapter 21. Jesus looked up. 
and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he, Jesus, said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. Now if you'll study this in the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that Mark gives us a little bit more detail And he tells us that the rich were putting in large sums. Doesn't describe what they were, but they're going into these collection boxes. Now, we as a church, we do the same idea. We have a collection box here in the back and one in the next room. You know, we don't pass a plate like some congregations do. And that's what happened right there in the temple. I showed you a picture of the temple before. And we've looked at the temple complex. But what I have circled is actually the temple area itself. And inside of that area, when it's broke out, you'll see that there was actually a a section known as the treasury. The treasury had these 13 columns there. And these columns actually worked as receptacles, receptacles where people could put their gifts in. They would put in gold, they would put in silver, you know, they would even, in some cases, put in wood carvings, those sorts of things, as an offering for the temple, to maintain the temple, to take care of the poor, all those kinds of things. They would even, in some cases, put like turtle doves and pigeons, you know, in the offering boxes. Uh, Our treasurer has asked that if none of you would do that, it would be nice, okay? It is so much harder to count the turtle doves. But... What we see in contrast here, because Luke is trying to make a contrast, and so is Jesus, by the way, between what the rich are doing and what this poor widow is doing. And she, in essence, is giving this little tiny coin. I've shown you some of these coins before, and here's what the coin would have been. You see there in the palm how small this little copper coin was. She puts in two of them. They're like two cents at most is what that would have been worth in the first century. They're almost nothing, seemingly. But what does Jesus say about her offering? That she gave more than the others did. Now, he's certainly not talking about in terms of quantity, but he is talking about in terms of practice. That practically, she's given more. Don't miss why. Because she gave out of her scarcity. The others... They had been giving out of their abundance. Wow, I don't know about some of you, but for me, that's convicting a little bit, right? I was reading a commentary this week, and here's what one of the Bible scholars said. He said, the main point appears to be that God measures the gifts of his people not on the basis of their size, but on the basis of how much remains. Wow. Could you imagine God watching us as we give offering? And he says, here's what they gave. And here's what they kept for themselves. And that's what God is observing. And so someone who has almost nothing like this poor widow gives even substantially more than somebody who has so much in abundance. You see again the contrast that Jesus is trying to make here between both the rich and the poor, but don't miss this. He's making the contrast between the widow and the scribe. In their devotion. See, let me ask you a question. Why did the widow give all that she had? What did that show? It showed dependence, reliance, right? What else did it show? It showed love. It showed devotion. Her devotion was sacrificial. Where the scribes had been pretentious, kind of just going through the motions, making it look like they were super religious and super devoted to God, she genuinely was. And she put her entire future in the hands of God. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount said these words, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Where would you say the widow's heart was? It was with the Lord, and that's why she followed it with her treasure. Can I make this real for us and kind of bring these ideas together? First of all, sometimes when we hear the idea that Jesus is both God and man, we just kind of let that fly right over the tops of our head, and and we miss the significance of it. It is significant. 
Jesus as man is somebody who is very relatable to us. It was great that he became one of us. It's great that he even understands us. Scripture tells us in Hebrews, it says that he understands our weaknesses. He faced all the same testings we do, yet he didn't sin. See, Jesus gets you. Jesus gets me as a man. But as God, he's transcendent. He's holy. He's righteous. He's both a creator of all things and a destroyer of them. When we, as everyone will, stand before God, there will be shock and awe. By example, I take you to the Apostle John. You might recall what is said about John in the New Testament, that he is the disciple that Jesus, what? Loved. This is a guy who walked with Jesus for three years, that Jesus loved. And yet, when we see him in Revelation, and Jesus appears to him on the Isle of Patmos, Do you remember what he does? Scripture tells us that he falls on his face before Jesus as if dead. He is in shock and awe about who Jesus is as God. Don't miss that piece because some of us are making the same mistake they were making in the early church. We're trying to make him either all God or all man. He's both. He's all God. He's all man. He's both. And there's got to be a constant tension that we face in our relationship with him. That as a holy and righteous God, he hates our sin. He hates our immoral and corrupt behavior. He hates it. He can't even be in the same room with it as God. But as man, he comes to offer himself as a Messiah. As a deliverer. As a savior who's willing to go to a cross and take the punishment that you should have taken, that I should have taken, and taking it upon himself. And then he rises from the dead to show that we will too. And then he just offers us this free gift of new life. He says, do you believe? Do you believe? He is the resurrection and the life. Scripture tells us that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And so when you stand before the awesome God, Jesus, in shock and awe, you will also be standing before the man who gave his life so that you would have life. And if you have a relationship with that man, then you have relationship with that God. If you don't, that's not going to be good. I just want to encourage you today that if you've not dealt with that issue, you ought to get that right. None of us know how much time we got left. And the reality is this is a free gift. That's the good news of Jesus Christ, that you just have to choose to say, okay, I believe. I don't totally get it. I don't understand how somebody could be both God and both man and how somebody could die on a cross and come back from the grave. I don't get it. But I believe it. And I want to put my faith and trust in it. But that leads us to the second thing we've talked about today. Is your devotion pretentious? Or is it sacrificial? I got to tell you, as I've studied this this week, there's been a lot of conviction in my heart. As I recognize a time in my own spiritual Christian journey that I was checking the boxes You know, I was doing the things that you're supposed to do when you're a churchgoer, when you're a Christian, right? Reading my Bible, saying some prayers, going to church, giving a little bit of money here and there. You know, I was checking the boxes, thinking it was all good. But I never did it sacrificially. Just to be brutal with you, I was living for me. I wasn't living for God. I never would have thought to give everything that I had and put it in a treasury box And put myself in total dependence on what God would do for me. I remember even when I first started tithing. Because for us, it was was a challenge when we first started doing that. But I knew I was still going to get paid in two weeks. I knew that I could put some stuff on the credit card until I got paid. I was never in a situation where I gave it all like the widow did. 
I would have to tell you, I don't know that I've ever personally sacrificially given in the way this widow did. I don't know that I've ever showed faith in the way that that widow showed faith. But I've got to tell you, I want to. I want to. See, I, I want to be like her. I don't want to be like a scribe. I don't want to be like a Pharisee. I don't want Jesus telling me when I stand before you, depart from me. I don't even know you. You've just been going through the motions. I want when I stand before God for him to welcome me with open arms to the kingdom of God. What do you want? There's a great passage that Jesus gives that I think speaks to this whole issue of what this woman did. And he says, give, and it will be given to you. Let me stop just for a second. Do you believe that, Christian? Give, and it will be given to you. I challenge you this morning to just go home and, and wrestle with that. Do I believe that? Do I trust that? Because Jesus goes on to say, Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Well, if what's going to be measured back to me is going to be determined on what I gave, then I need to be a little bit more mindful of that, do I not? I need to learn how to be more sacrificial in what I'm doing. Winston Churchill, who I don't even believe was, I don't believe was a Christian, made a great statement, I think. He said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Are you making a living or are you making a life? Because I know which one I'd rather do. Tom Brady was interviewed on 60 Minutes. Anybody see the interview? It was a curious thing because at a certain point in the interview, he said, uh, why do I have these Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? Listen to his words here. A lot of people would think, man, you've reached your dream. This is it. This is him speaking. Me? I think there's got to be more than this. Wow, this coming from a guy together with his wife who's a supermodel. He's one of the most famous, most successful quarterbacks ever. Is saying something's still missing. The guy who was conducting the interview, Steve Croft, said, what's the answer? Guess what Brady said? I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Can I tell you and vicariously tell Tom? It's in a single word, and it's a name. And it's the name of Jesus. See, see, what's missing for a Tom Brady, what's missing for so many other people, is Jesus. And not just simply that they believe in him, but they are devoted to him. They're wanting to live sacrificially for him. See, that's where true life happens. And it's up to us to decide, what's it going to be? Would you stand? You know, I said earlier that uh, a little bit like the... Um, scribes, you know, how Jesus was trying to, you know, wake them up. I hope some of that happened in your life today. Not, not because of my words, but because of the Holy Spirit of God. I hope the Holy Spirit of God spoke to you today and said, hey, let's stop playing games. Is this for real or not? Because if it's not, go live for the world. Why are you even wasting your time here? But if it's real, let's get serious about our devotion. Let's get serious about what matters and what doesn't. Let's get serious about not making a living, but making a life. Amen? Did you go before the Lord? Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.